specifically of um, the state level of, of fellowships. And then we have a whole bunch of people here who I think are going to be um, available for questions and answers for their uh, different experiences with state fellowships. So um, I know that you have heard a lot about the AAAS fellowship, I think. Um, and so where I'm coming in is just thinking about all the different ways that scientists can really be involved in science policy. I myself work at a boundary spanning organization and I got here through my fellowship. Um, and that's been a really important pathway for my career. Um, you may have already talked about this, but this is in my mental roadmap. So I'll say some of these things. Um, you know, you can be involved in science policy in a whole bunch of different ways. You can be advising, you could be managing programs that operate towards some science-based mission. You can um, work in advocacy, communications, technical writing. Uh, there's so many different ways, research, education. Um, and then you can also be working in a bunch of different settings so about working at a nonprofit, like I have the pleasure of doing um, in industry, professional associations, think tanks, academia, lobbying firms, and then of course within government. You've talked a lot about the opportunities I think federal government um, working, for instance, as a scientist in an executive branch, um, if you're at the federal government, if you can be supporting work that Congress is doing, that's a great opportunity. Um, and it, it can be really similar in state government. So um, you have opportunity to work in executive branch as scientists or um, in, in any of the other, other other ways that you can interact. Um, and I don't know what the statistics are currently, but I know that as of 2020, more scientists were working in state government settings than in federal government. So the executive branch offers a, a lot of opportunity. Also, the legislative branch is, is a place where a lot of work gets done. What's really interesting, though, is that across state, there's this huge variation in the way that state legislators operate. So whereas California has a full-time professional legislature, not all states have that. Some are part-time, um, some are volunteer, some, you know, meet every other year. So it, it's, a, it's a really broad range of, of how a, a legislative opportunity might present itself. Um, the fellowship, policy fellowship landscape has changed a lot over the last 15 years. CCST is just um, actually selected for its 16th cohort. Um, and we usually say that our fellowship is modeled after the AAAS fellowship. Um, it's interesting though, because a lot of end up going into the or the smaller number that go into uh, congressional fellowships. This T historically was all, um, and then it expanded in 2020. So that's, that's an expansion on that program's part. Um, about 15, 16 years ago, when CCST was getting started as a state fellowship program, though, there really weren't other state fellowships that were uh, around. Um, and I would love to send your teachers materials as well from CCSC. We have a guide about um, how to chart a path, a career path in science policy. And then we also have a really helpful handout for lots of different active state policy fellowships right now. Um, so whereas, whereas about 16 years ago or 15 years ago, there was really only CCST um, as far as state policy fellowships that were not specifically like C grant or um, like a state C grant or something like that. Now there are, I think, 12 active state level policy fellowships. And just make sure that if my audio is bad and I can call in if it's
Yeah, I might have to do that. Um, oh, so sorry. Yeah, I could I could hear you right now, so I was waiting to see, but um, yeah, maybe let's try that. Here, usually there's a way to just call. So, so sorry. Or maybe just turn off your video. Yeah, I'll turn off my video and see if that helps. So uh, I apologize for missing that chatter. I hope that um, my comments were mostly um, transmitted. What I was saying is that opportunities might have been very useful. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you heard. There are a lot more opportunities nowadays at the state uh, level. Science policy fellowships can be really exciting because you're sometimes it's just it feels a lot more nimble to be working at the state. You can interrupt. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit. Please let me know if I should call in and I will. Somebody just sent me a number okay I yeah let's do that then sorry I am so sorry. I'm having a lot of trouble here. <laughs> I'm going to log off and log back in from a different spot where I hopefully can have better reception. Apologies. Okay. All right, um, let me just get set back up here. Um, so I think all I was saying was that the opportunity to participate in a state level science and policy uh, fellowship is, is a, there are a lot more opportunities to do that now. Um, I will send you a, um, printout of all of the active state fellowships that we interact with. I know in the period between 2017, 2019, CCST actually gave out some seed grants in order to try to get there to be other state fellowships that were doing something similar to what we do, but for different models, different types. And so I know that Brittany's not here, so um, she won't be able to talk about the most model, but one really interesting um, comparison between different programs is the way that CCST's fellowships look versus the way that most fellowships work, which is the Missouri State uh, Science and Technology Fellowship, where with the CCST fellowship, there is um, legislative office placement and executive branch office placement and fellows in the CCST fellowship are acting like staff. Um, whereas in the most fellowship, they have such an interesting model. They're working with 
sort of like an adjacent body that's kind of like the um, our Senate of Office of Research, where they're providing a bunch of research to different offices and things. And so they're working through this through this other party um, to provide a bunch of research and background. And so the, the model's just really different. And there's been a ton of success and a lot of uptake in that program. So there's a lot of excitement around that. The point of it is that, that there are so many different ways that legislatures are. Um, and there are so many different kinds of programs that have uh, been been developing their programs and then there are, are probably like at least a dozen others that are in the um, early stages of developing their programs and hoping to get a cohort in the next couple of years. So I would be very happy to share that with you all. Um, and let's see. Um, let me just give a quick list of some of those. So there's the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering, Idaho Science and Technology Policy Fellowship, uh, MOST, Missouri Science and Technology Policy Initiative, Rutgers, uh, Rockefeller in New York. Um, so I, I know that there's somebody here from the Eagleton, so I was just going to skip over that. Um, there's the Governor Science and Technology Policy Fellowship in Pennsylvania, West Virginia Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. So those are those are for. Um, graduate student degree holders. And then there are also some that are for people who are currently graduate students. So there's one in Colorado, there's one in Indiana, um, an example of a, a state-based Sea Grant fellowship is in North Carolina. So there are, there are a whole bunch of different ways, different kinds of fellowships that you can be a part of. Uh, so it's just a really exciting time. Um, I would love to talk a little bit about CCST, but I know that I've eaten up a lot of time in the technical issues. So how much time do I have? Maybe just five minutes. Okay. All right. So CCST, California Council on Science and Technology, is a full stop boundary spanning organization. We do our science services, which is the area that I direct. Um, which include everything that we do to connect science and technology experts throughout the state of California to policy experts. And we do that through our science services that can be um, big peer reviewed reports or expert briefings or, you know, um, one pagers. There are a whole bunch of different ways we do it. And one of our most important and impactful programs is our Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. As I mentioned, we just selected our 16th cohort. Um, we generally have in the past had around 10 fellows who were placed in legislative offices. These can be either um, committees or um, personal offices. It changes from year to year and that base, that's based on what the um, legislative leadership is looking for and, and, and wanting to have fellows contribute to. Um, so, it, it, you know, some years it's mostly committee work or entirely committee work. In other years, it's a mix between committee and personal offices where you're staffing um, a member of the legislature. And then, as I also said, in 2020, we expanded to the executive branch. So now we have, on average, about 10 in the legislative branch and about five in the executive branch. But again, that changes from year to year. And there's a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunities in the executive branch. So um, fellows that come to CCST have a PhD in hand by the time that they've started the fellowship. They spend a year um, in science policy and leadership training that starts with a month of what we call boot camp, where there is really intensive training, uh, everything that on day one starts with, do you know who the governor of California is? <laughs> and then moves into, here's how you write a background or here's how you handle, you know, um, moving a bell. Here's how you talk to a committee consultant, lots of different things, um, you know, etiquette in the Capitol, things like that. And then also really important um, trainings on policy. Um, what, is really important is that we're um, looking for people who are flexible, who are confident in their science, but are not necessarily coming with a specific viewpoint. They just are open to 
um, sharing their skill set and the way that they're able to think and the way they've been trained to think and bring research into conversations with policymakers. So it's a really excellent opportunity. It's really exciting. Um, if you're a good communicator who's interested in science and how that can be um, brought to bear in the policy landscape, then the state science policy fellowship is, is a, a good way to be thinking about how to get into a career in policy. I think I'll stop there because I am still recovering from the <laughs> kerfuffle from before and I appreciate everybody's patience with my technology issues today. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, it's it's really exciting and interesting to see that um, CCST has sprung so many other um, opportunities around the country. I guess I'm wondering kind of where do you see the landscape going in the future, right? Because there's, you know, different models for this in different states. And we have uh, Aaron here to talk about that, too. Um, yeah, what do you kind of foresee in the next five years and at the state level? What I see in California is is, is a lot of excitement and growing um, appreciation for this kind of um, this kind of skill set. I think that it's going to be different in every state, and it's going to depend on how the different state fellowships you know start out and do. And it really depends on the kind of champions you have. So for instance, in the legislature, if you have people who are speaking well of fellows, then I think people will continue to be excited to get fellows. I mean, it's free labor, very highly trained labor. And a lot of what we would hear, so I started out as a year five science fellow. And when I started out, people were like, why would we want a scientist walk? Like, who cares that you have a PhD in science? Like I don't, in science, first of all, it's literally how it would often be communicated. Um, and people didn't really get it. Now people get it. And they see that, you know, it's, it's so many of the world's challenges and these go down all the way to local level. So everybody's working on these huge challenges that require this really interdisciplinary thinking. They require scientists and that is inclusive of physical scientists, biological scientists, social scientists, and thinking about economics. How does that relate? There's, there's so many huge overlapping challenges that I think that there's this recognition that we're going to need more and more highly skilled people who are able to work with lots of different sectors, lots of different disciplines, and people who are training through a PhD program in practically any science are gaining these skills, even though they're not necessarily marketed to PhD students as such valuable skills. Um, so I guess that was a very roundabout way to saying that um, the value of this type of fellowship in state government seems to be only increasing in it in people's awareness of it. And I would expect it to be continuing in that direction. Yeah, for sure. Um, the other question I have is, um, can you talk about or kind of what what su success means to you in the fellowship? So can you, do you have things you can talk about that were really successful pointing back to CCST and the model that you have set? Um, yeah, so one thing uh, that I, I think a, a big measure of success for CCST organizationally is the number of um, fellows who remain in state government positions, state policy positions. So of the alumni it, who have gone through our program, there are 36% that have remained in California state government itself. And that's the majority of our alumni have stayed in policy positions. So if they're not in state government, they're in federal government, they're in um, um, policy think tanks, they're in uh, other nonprofits and research areas. So that's a really big measure of success as far as how the fellowship has helped people in their careers. Then on the other side, so many people staying in state government, I am constantly running into CCST fellows who have made it into higher levels of um, California state government. And so, you know, the demand for fellows is going up, the positions for fellows to occupy after their fellowships is going up, and it's sort of a um, 
a cycle. <laughs> Well, that's great. I know there are a few a few questions that Chavi, you can you can answer in the chat, um, so we can move on. But we really appreciate this overview, and please do send us any materials that you have. Um, we have quite a, a lots of folks here who are from U UCI and other places in California, and I'm sure would be interested in applying. And I'll just say too that it's not limited to people who are in California. We have had a number of people from out of state from out of the country who have been eligible to apply. So everybody is welcome. Perfect, thank you again. Okay, so um, we can move on to our panel. Can get the slide up. Um, perfect, so um, we have Chanel, who's currently a program officer with the National Academies and she's a former CCST fellow, so you can ask more questions. Um, and then just keeping around here. So Aaron is in the New Jersey uh, fellowship. So I'm curious to hear more about that and, and how it's different. And then Daniel, um, who was a former Research America fellow. So we have another um, state, um, sorry, federal fellowship that uh, is different from what we heard. And he's currently the director of the Milken Institute Sense Philanthropy Accelerator for Research and Collaboration. So also very interesting. Um, Career path you have, Daniel. So we'll talk about that. Awesome. So I think um, just piggybacking on um, Bree's introduction, I'll um, ask Chanel to tell tell us a little bit about your fellowship experience and how that's um, helped your career for now. Sure. Hi everyone. So happy to be here, and thank you to Adriana and the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was a CCST fellow in the 2019-2020 cycle. Um, I came in within a year or two after my PhD and had some um, prior experience um, in different science policy contexts. So as a grad student um, at Johns Hopkins, my um, colleagues and I co-founded Johns Hopkins Science Policy Group, and that later became part of the larger National Science Policy Network, which is a fantastic organization that supports um, young scholars like yourselves in the sciences who are interested in um, civic engagement and science policy. Uh, and so that was um, a community that offered connection, engagement, and training opportunities that helped prepare me for the fellowship um, before, before I got in. Um, and so um, as a fellow, I was placed in a legislative committee in the Senate. Uh, so that means that my role was to work alongside other legislative committee consultants to analyze bills that were up for review by, by members. Our committee was the Committee on Senate Education. So my portfolio was kind of a hodgepodge of things, but it included um, financial aid for foster care students, um, school lunch programs, um, School start time was a controversial bill that year. Uh, at, this is an example of where being a science fellow ended up being really valuable um, for the committee because there was a lot of science and this was something that was strongly supported by the American Medical Association that um, adolescents, their circadian clock shifts later. And so having school start times be so early contributes to negative outcomes, not only for their academic performance, but overall for their physical and mental health. And so that became um, a contentious issue when you were balancing the, um, the needs of the students against the administrative and, and sort of infrastructural difficulties of shifting school start time and bus routes and everyone's schedules by you know, half an hour or an hour after school programs would have to move, et cetera. So my background was in neuroscience, but I worked on issues that um, were sort of, you know, all over the place. And uh, the skills that I found that sort of were relevant um, from the lab to the legislature was thinking critically, um, knowing how to read and, and parse data, um, knowing how to ask, you know, really good questions. What's the underlying issue? Um, being able to understand the nuances of three, four different sides of a question, um, where yes, uh, the sort of scientific perspective is a really important um, sort of, uh, you know, represents a really important, um, I don't know, stance, uh, but there are other um, equally valid stances that have to be, have to be weighed. And so uh, what really helped me launch into the program where I am now, where I'm a I uh, serve at the National Academies, which is a not-for-profit 
um, s and Policy Research Institute is <clears throat> knowing how to speak to different combinations of stakeholders about an issue, um, sort of understanding what the buttons and levers of progress are. If you want to take action or you want to move on an issue, you want to um, have fair free transit for you know community college students you want to have a uh, reduced fare you know lunch for um you know low income you know children in a certain county um what does it mean to actually affect that uh when there is opposition to these programs um how can you understand their point of view in a way that is fair in a way that it's balanced how can you integrate um or sort of be understanding of their concerns and have that reflected in the final policy negotiation. So I had a really fantastic time in the program. Um, and like many other CCST fellows, ended up staying another year, year and a half in, in the state legislature. I moved over to support a committee on transportation, again, straight a long way from neuroscience, where there uh, I worked mainly on issues relating to um, bus and metro cycling and pedestrian issues, um, safe bike routes, safe cycling, um, how can we share the road and um, thinking about mobility and road sharing as an equity issue um, that folks need to be able to get around other than having a, a car, right? And so um, in my current job, I certainly use all of that every day, negotiating skills, being able to brief orally um, and in writing, whether you have 30 seconds or whether you have uh, an hour. Um, managing a sponsor, a sponsor being someone who is, you know, volunteering to help you develop a position on the issue, um, working with um, the person on, on an opposing side, and again, having a very open mind um, and trying to understand where can we meet on, on common ground. Um, and then because much of the work I did was not neuroscience, being able to sort of be a jack of all trades scientist um, in, a, in a very short amount of time, becoming not an expert, but knowing enough, knowing enough on the issue to be able to make an informed data-driven decision um, that's in line with serving your team, your representative, you know, your committee's uh, larger goals. Uh, and so I think that's probably enough of, of an intro, but I'm happy to take other questions about my experience uh, or about work at the National Academies. Perfect. Yeah, that's really fascinating how you covered a lot of different areas. And I think to your point, things that you weren't trained in, but you're able to use those skills towards a lot of different policy areas um, and really good advice too for somebody who's going to a fellowship. So thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move to Erin. Tell us a little bit about your experience in New Jersey. Sure. So um I am actually currently a fellow. I started in July of last year, two days after I defended my thesis. I don't recommend that timeline if anyone was wondering, very stressful. Um, but I was really grateful that Eagleton was willing to be flexible because technically I was supposed to start the week before um, and obviously that wasn't gonna work. So I appreciated that they were willing to wait a little bit. Um, but yeah, I've been a fellow for almost a year. Um, the Eagleton slash New Jersey Fellowship is in some ways modeled after the CCST, which is sort of modeled after the AAAS. So there are certain components that are structurally quite similar. Um, so we have both legislative and executive fellows. Um, we've had, I think, both for all six years that we've been around at this point. Um, at the moment, we have three sort of tracks. So there's legislative, executive, and then we have a climate track that will um, definitely place you within the part of the executive branch that handles sort of the entire like clean energy transition. We call it the Board of Public Utilities, but they're in charge of like building electrification, um, increasing efficiencies, greening up the grid, all of that stuff. Um, so when you apply, you can rank your top options. I knew I wanted to do legislative, so I don't even remember what I said for the other two categories, but I was thrilled to join the legislative branch. Um, our legislature is set up differently to California. Technically, our legislators are part time, even though they meet like 10 months out of the year. Um, and so we don't place our fellows 
with specific legislators. Instead, we place them within um, different caucuses. So we have the General Assembly and the Senate, and each one has a majority and a minority caucus. And the majority caucus has a much larger staff. Um, so generally, our legislative fellows end up going in the majority caucus, which at the moment, um, both chambers are run by Democrats. So I work in the assembly majority office for the Speaker of the General Assembly. Um, and in that role, I staff two committees, which at the moment is um, telecommunications and utilities, which is broadband expansion, um, natural gas utilities, the entire clean energy transition. And then I also staff um, the Science, Innovation and Technology Committee, which is sort of a catch all for stuff that is cutting edge and there's no precedent for how to deal with it. Um, and the legislators are nervous about it. So that would be like robotics, AI, deep fakes, anything that <laughs> their constituents are worried, excuse me, are worried, they're worried and nobody knows what to do. Um, so I am in charge of both of those. Um, the other difference I think is that while we do work with committees, um, we don't have like a team of people for the committee, it's just me. Um, and then I work directly with the chair for that committee. Um, and I think another big difference is that, I guess because of how power is, is, is distributed within the New Jersey legislature, fellows and the other staffers that I work with that handle the other committees have a lot more influence. So we get to propose bills to put on committee agendas. We work together with the chair to propose them for the speaker to either approve or reject. Um, so I get to say, you know, this is a really good bill. I think that we should hear it, like we should move it out of committee. Um, I also have the free reign to identify issues and get my own bills drafted. Um, and then once I have the bill, I meet with different legislators and find somebody who is convinced that this is a good idea and then they introduce it. Um, so we get to research policy, we get to help draft bills. Um, we move them through the legislative process by staffing the committees. Um, we negotiate amendments with stakeholders, we meet with lobbyists, um, and then we make sure that they seamlessly move through and get voted out of our house and into the other house. Um, so just this past weekend, we had to pass the state budget. The deadline was yesterday, so we're all very happy that we managed to pass it before the deadline and we didn't have to shut down all the beaches in New Jersey, because that would have been really unpopular. Um, so that was a really exciting day. We were there until like 7 p.m. in the voting session and everyone was exhausted. Um, but I really like how, I guess because the legislature is part-time, because of how things are distributed within the speaker's office, within the Senate president's office, um, you're really sort of embedded in the center of this dynamic and varied sort of fast paced environment, which is something I really wanted. I know that the executive branch is a very different vibe. You're much more focused on one area or two areas. Whereas I have a background in immunology. I did do health policy for a few months and now I'm doing technology policy, environmental policy, energy. I do not have a background in these things, just an interest. And now suddenly I am the expert everybody's coming to me with their AI bills and saying, is this a good idea? Do we need to change this? And I'm like, okay, give me two days and I'll meet with some experts and I'll figure out what's wrong with it and we'll fix it. Um, so that is something I really love about the fellowship. Um, but in many other ways, I think it's very similar to CCST. Um, I actually am staying on in my current role, which technically is starting in like a week or something because um, my fellowship ends, I think, on the 9th. So I'm going to be staying on my same assignments, same workload, same everything, except now I'm getting paid more, which is, that's going to be nice. Um, I actually did apply for some other fellowships um, because I knew mine was coming to an end. So I applied to AAAS. And I actually got the, um, the AAAS Congressional and Executive Fellowships earlier this year, but I, thank you, <laughs> After a lot of soul searching, I turned them both down to stay in New Jersey, 
which I'm happy to talk about more. I know that that is maybe not what people would have expected. And it's not really what I expected either, but um, I had a good reason for it. So I'll leave it at that. We have more time for questions later. Very cool. Well, I think it's really interesting. What do you think about the two different legislatures and you know how you're doing things in New Jersey? Sounds like you have a lot of power too, because you're working with a committee and things you're able to do is really cool. Um, yeah, really helpful. I'm glad you it worked out for you to just stay there. Sounds like you really like it. Cool. All right. Well, um, so we'll move on to Daniel. Um, so as I said, he he did the uh, Research America Fellowship. So wanted to bring somebody who who did a federal fellowship that is not AAAS. And kind of how did you, what did you do in the fellowship and how did you leverage that to where you are? Yeah, um, thanks um, Adriana for that. And great to meet and see everybody and great to hear all the stories from Aaron and Chanel, as well as Bree. Um, so I'm Daniel Pham. Um, I, I'm gonna tell this origin story and Adriana and Chanel especially have heard it about 30 times now. But um, when I was a second year grad student, um, my partner at the time and now my husband um, who is definitely not a scientist, his words, um, one day turned to me and said, or he asked, what is your project on again? And so very excitedly, I spent an hour trying to explain to him what a neuron was. Um, and by the end of it, we were both really mad at each other. And um, <laughs> thanks for now. Uh, and, and at that point, I, I realized, you know, what a bad communicator I was. You know, if I couldn't tell my loved ones the importance of my work, how could I tell people who have power? How do I tell people who are on my committee, who are um, controlling budgets, who are controlling policy? So at that point really was um, the flashpoint for my wanting to explore this world because there's such a need and everybody in my program, you know, faced the same kind of challenges. So um, Chanel was also there with me and along with her and a, a lot of other um, classmates, we started an organization called Project Bridge, where we focused on science outreach, um, giving scientists opportunities to speak more to the public and practice communication beyond the lab. And that really set me on the course to, um, you know, really fall in love with the idea of the science communication umbrella. Um, and then um, as I was finishing up my, my PhD, um, some people from Research America came to um, our um, our university to talk about what they did. And at the end of it, I came up to them and I asked them, hey, maybe we should work together and, and do a joint program. So ended up um, through Project Bridge, kind of, and um, also Chanel's um, program. Um, we did an, an, uh, hold a, held an event called Even Advocate to advocate for 21st century cures. Um, so because you know, it was only for that reason was probably why I was able to get the Research America Fellowship. So as I was finishing up, it was a mad dash to just, you know, not only you have to write up your thesis, you have to prepare for your defense, get all your families come to come and also look for a job. And I applied for about like 50 jobs. Um, many of them I was woefully underqualified for. And I got one, and that was the Research America Fellowship, probably because I had a very close interaction with them and they knew who I was and I was a known entity to them. So um, the, re the fellowship was great because it was also pretty short. Um, I unfortunately couldn't meet the timelines of the AAAS because that those are pretty strict. And I didn't want to do a postdoc to wait for those nine months so there were a, a lot of other options at that point, one of them being the fellowship. Um, on day two, I went to a, a congressional briefing on the Hill and some person came up to me and asked me what I did. And I froze and I, I couldn't say that, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just a second day. This is the second day on the job. I don't really know anything. So you kind of have to like BS your way through and kind of very related to Aaron and Chanel's like, all of a sudden you are an, you wear a totally different hat you know your expectations change completely and and that transition was actually pretty tough like i i had a hard time ever feeling as as well educated as i was in my phd right because you spend six years learning on one subject and all of a sudden like i know how, how aaron you do it like ai and technology that's crazy but for me it was just you know 
I was a science fellowship fellow. Um, and for this job, we focus a lot on, uh, on, on the federal government, so mostly Congress. Uh, we went to a lot of briefings. Uh, we held briefings as well. So um, brought together organizations that were, you know, a lot of universities and research institutions, um, advocacy organizations um, together to form uh, events on the Hill to educate um, Hill staffers mostly. And, you know, one thing I really learned in those five months was that advocacy works as coalitions, right? You you never are strong enough unless you're with other people. And, and more voices, the more voices you have, to, the the louder you are, and, and the more people will hopefully hear you. And so we were on, you know, there's there's a there's a coalition to support NIH, there's a coalition to support um, uh, NSF, any any federal agency, especially that works in science. Um, Research America was a part of. So there's a lot of learnings that happened in those few months. Um, and from there, I moved on to um, the uh, American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology as their public affairs manager. So one learning there was that I you only need a pretty short fellowship in order to, to get a full-time position. So again, mine was only five months. Um, I was only paid $30,000 know, a time. <laughs> it was equivalent to $30,000 a year in those five months. So similar to what I was paid as a um, as a grad student, but you know I I was able to live then, and so I I could continue for that short time. Um, so that was one drawback from from that fellowship, but uh, really worth it in the end, where that leveraged into the ASBNB. And one thing to quickly tie into the state government um, uh, fellowships that you were hearing about. At my position at ASBMB, even though we also focused on um, the federal government, I was able to create um, the ASBMB, the ATP, which is the Advocacy Training Program. And very similar to what we did here, where uh, we brought on 10 or 12 people from our membership from who was in ASBMB um, and provided them an eight week training. And they were able to focus on whatever science policy topic they wanted to, and that ranged from local government all the way through federal government. And the ones that succeeded the most really were the ones in city councils and state legislatures. We had a person who was able to be appointed onto several um, um, advisory boards for his city in, in Reno, which was really exciting. And people were able to connect much more deeply in state legislatures, just because there's just, you know, I think people overlook the, that importance, but so much state law and local law govern your life, much more so from the day to day, at least, um, or maybe equally so, I don't know how much I would weigh it, but they're equally important. Um, so it's just something that's really uh, often overlooked. And 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 as, as at the end, I, I ended up changing out of advocacy into um, the Milpin Institute. Um, now it's called the Science uh, Philanthropy Accelerator for Research and Collaboration. I had a hard time at the end of the day because at ASBMB we were a small fish in a big pond and I felt like I was just screaming into the ether and didn't get much done. And that was how I, that was the reason why I created an ATP was because I wanted more traction. Um, but when that was done, um, I was looking for something new. And so at my current job, and I'll just quickly speak to this, um, I work with philanthropists who are, who are interested in donating money to cure a disease or make new treatments to certain uh, research areas, um, largely because they have a loved one who has it or they themselves have the condition and they just don't know how to do it. So us as scientists really know um, that landscape and the difficulty of getting money into science and not just getting that money onto a building. So how does that money go straight to a researcher who actually is making a difference and making really cool innovative programs where we're essentially forcing learnings and collaborations and open science and um, supporting early career researchers and all the things that we really care about, we can build from the ground up for these philanthropists so that there's really maximized impact for the money that they give so that in the future, federal governments will see that this area that's historically been underfunded 
and get more funding and really get that big wheel of federal dollars. So I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer any questions. That's cool. Well, I think you have a really interesting path. And yeah, I could probably tell that story now. <laughs> Heard it so many times. Uh, but it's still a cool story. Um, I think it's really interesting. First of all, like it's a small world that you know you and Chanel knew each other and worked together. And so that's a good lesson for folks here that you know people know each other. Um also that kind of how you were able to insert yourself into this world and you know somewhat serendipity in, in some ways i think you're in the right place at the right time and, and these things happen but also i think being smart about where opportunities are and to your point like realizing oh this fellowship is enough for me to move on to something else and so i think being smart and realizing is this the best thing or you know how can i move on where do i want to go from here so yeah um one thing I think, um, yeah, philanthropy focus. Yeah, this is something that's that's been growing more for sure. I think there's been a lot more discussions about grant funding and also how philanthropic uh, funding can, can supplement that and in really interesting time. Um, I think one thing you mentioned I wanted to come back to and also kind of ask, ask the question to the group about um, you mentioned kind of this was a tough transition when you first went through it and, you know, learning the language and getting into that world. Because I, want I wanted to ask also about um, something that was exciting or that you think is a success from your fellowship that sort of helped you transition, but also talking a little bit about the hardships that you went through. Um, and so I don't know, Daniel, if you want to kind of continue down that path and then we'll go around. Yeah, I'll, I'll just be uh, brief. I it was a, it was hard, but like, like the day one, I realized that I had nothing. To, I had to do nothing after five p.m. was incredible, right? I didn't have any mouse lines to take care of. I didn't have any cell lines that I was worried about them dying. I didn't have any papers to write. You know, like that was such a huge weight off my back, and it was just that feeling, like the internal feeling of just not. The, the like imposter syndrome, the lack of confidence when you are in a room, especially when that space, a lot of people care about how people look and how people talk and how people carry themselves, right? Like it, it, it's unfortunately has a lot of um, perception and that's not something you're used to as a scientist um, because we, you know, come into lab at like 10 a.m. and you're in your, your shorts sometimes and, um, you know, non-regulated clothing. But uh, I, I think once you get past that, you realize that, you know, it only takes you, you, it takes you so much less time to, to absorb information than others. I think that is the superpower that, that you want to really harness and not feeling like you ever need to dig as deep anymore. Like that's just like, or it's like almost psychopathic <laughs> to feeling like you need to dig that deep all the time and all the different things to make you feel like you can convey yourself. One thing that I felt really helpful in my current role, because I also still sit in a like, like I now work in bipolar disorder as well as sarcoidosis, which is a rare immune disorder. Like these things I have no studies, no training in. And one thing my supervisor tells me all the time is that for our role is that we are the mirror to the field and not the sponge. We will never be the expert. So as Aaron was saying that you you went to talk to AI experts, right? So you are the, you convey, you get, gather information you kind of regurgitate it and, and reframe it to what you need and then make sure that both sides are happy, right? Both the AI experts are happy as well as the legislators are happy. And that's really our role. We're, 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 we're tying a bunch of expert domains into our brains and then reorganizing it so that another group understands it, whether it be legislators, whether they be advocates, whether they be philanthropists, right? It's all the same. It's, it's that it's that um, ability that's again really important. That's really helpful. Well, I'll move on to uh, Chanel, if you can tell us about kind of your transition and also something exciting from the fellowship. Sure. Um, my transition, perhaps, um, I came in with some prior science policy experiences. So another um, federal fellowship that I did prior to CCST. This was actually something that I did as a bridge out of my PhD um, before uh, formally leaving the lab, but it was with 
FASAB, the Federation of American Societies for Exper Experimental Biology, but it's another scientific member organization. Um, and there we represented the interests of different um, scientific disciplines as they were responding or reacting to different regulations coming out of NIH, you know, R01 funding, um, international grad students, um, you know, sharing, you know, lab materials, um, you know, uh, the use of animals in research and things like that, um, you know, rare, rare materials and, and, and how to get them. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, my work with Johns Hopkins Science Policy Group, where we, uh, the goal was to sort of create a platform to teach ourselves, you know, how to communicate and advocate for science in a way that'd be relevant to policymakers. So all of that really helped with the bridge. Um, so in terms of things that were difficult, there was sort of um, fun hard and not fun hard. And so uh, fun hard was, oh, wow, um, I'm immersed in a, in a new topic. I don't know anything about it. I'm the so-called expert. How do I get up to speed in feeling that self-imposed pressure to have to prove something? You know, gosh, I'm going to be the smartest, you know, most brilliant science policy fellow ever. Um, and that certainly is, uh, should not be the expectation because that's not the goal. You know, the goal is to learn and to facilitate. Um, and so I think uh, advice I would give to folks who feel that pressure of, um, I have to learn everything all at once and be super brilliant, right, is to say, you know, really the legislative process is this large population-based collective decision-making process. And you're not uh, like a, a reagent in that process, you're a catalyst, right? And so whatever it is that your committee decides they want to do or that the boss that you serve, the elected member, what they want to do, whether you agree with it or not, and oftentimes you might not, you're there to facilitate the best possible outcome that allows you then to distance yourself from that outcome. Oh, my bill died in committee. This negotiation that I you know, really worked so hard to get the language just right. Oh, my boss doesn't like it and we're totally throwing it away. Um, you know that you did your job right if you facilitated that conversation, you know, professionally and expertly. You know you did your job right if you prepared a thorough oral briefing. You know you did your job right if you produced a, a comprehensive committee analysis. And whatever happens to that bill, you know, it becomes signed into action or not, you kind of get to wash your hands of it and let it go and say, I'm here to facilitate the next thing. Um, another thing that helps you kind of uh, be really comfortable as a facilitator in this really huge multi-modal process is that good work is never wasted. And so all of the research that you're doing, the many, many meetings you're having with um, bill supporters or detractors, you're gathering lots of information about that issue. And then something that I did that I left for my committee, which was great, was documentation. So in my little uh, portfolio of issue areas, you know, transit, bus, cycling, you know, sidewalk, um, you know, transit fares, I would leave behind detailed notes on this is what this particular constituent wants. You know, here's a, here are the negotiations that we considered but didn't try for X, Y, Z reason. It's almost like a lab notebook, right? And you leave that lab notebook behind, it goes into the archive. The idea being that when that issue comes up again, because it always comes up again, maybe the stars weren't aligned this year, but they may align in future years. Folks are not starting from square one. They can go back and look at Chanel's meeting notes from you know, June 30th, 2019 or whatever it was and go, oh, I can just pick up the phone and call so-and-so and we can sort of resume that conversation and see if that bill can make traction this year. So it's really gratifying to know that you're constantly contributing to this like ant trail you know, of, of, of progress. Um, uh, not not fun, hard. I forget which I started with, fun, hard or not fun, hard. That was the fun one, I think. Okay, the not fun one was, um, I suppose, being, you know, especially a senior grad student in my lab where I conceive of the experiment, you know, I'm making my triple transgenic mice, like I'm sort of deciding in collaboration with my PI what figures I want to make, and you, you have a lot of control, right? Um, you, you see a lot of that control when you're working in coalition or when you're working in the legislature where stuff can just flip on you, you know, overnight. And that can be really frustrating, especially when um, you've become quite attached, right, to that program or to that initiative. So it's frustrating to be like, ah, this is not how I would do it. But then you think to yourself, but I'm one person, you know, I don't have, no one really has sort of the global view on this issue. If when a bill dies, I may not like the reason, 
But uh, it takes so many people to agree on so many aspects that bills that die probably weren't ready. It means that there's a sticky issue. Some important stakeholder isn't quite yet happy. So better to, to wait, come around again and fix it than to push a bill that's incomplete or not really going to satisfy um, all of the affected parties, right? But Gosh, you know, letting go of that control, I think, was a little bit um, difficult. One exciting thing out of my fellowship, I think, was, okay, um, you know, California is a majority, um, is a, de Democrats lead, right? The, uh, have the, you know, political majority, right? Um, and so the heads of the committee are are of that party. So my, um, the committee chair was a, a, a Democratic legislative member. Um, and so a lot of the bills, you know, that we put a lot of energy into were Democratic bills. But there are Republican-led bills that you work on, you know, just as hard. One came through, though, um, that kind of was like running against the, 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 the theme, I suppose, of how my boss was ideologically aligned. It was a bill about um, parents in middle school who were, who were concerned that the sex ed content was not age appropriate for the children. Um, and the language was something like, we want to remove it entirely, or we want the ability to opt our children out of those days of, of, uh, of, of coursework. Um, and my boss was like, um, you know, this is a platform issue for me. You know, I, I believe in, you know, thorough, comprehensive, age appropriate sex ed for our kids. And we're certainly not going to let kids opt out. This is part of their state mandated education, blah, blah, blah. Um, but what was really exciting was taking meetings from these, uh, this, from this conservative, you know, led um, sort of coalition and really listening to the heart of the issue and finding areas where, okay, like it's mostly a no, but can I give you a yes and somewhere, right? And after lots of conversations, kind of getting past the bluster and sort of like the, you know, the blustery um, politics of it all and, oh, they're teaching our kids about you know, whatever it was, some of it was just sort of high level rhetoric, right? When you get past the rhetoric, um, I found like legitimate concerns these parents had that we actually could address together. And I was able to um, work with that team and my boss to fit in just a tiny amendment, um, basically that said that the parents, it would be easier for them to review the content or have a copy of it in advance. That way they could have conversations at home with their children before the teacher was presenting it in the classroom. So they could just be more um, actively involved um, in the conversation. And we thought that was very reasonable and we were able to reflect that in the bill. Um, had uh, One thing I will say that's cool as a science fellow is you can sort of ask for those little opportunities where it would have been very easy to be like, my boss is not interested in this conversation. The bill is moving forward as is. The answer is no. I'm sorry. Have a nice day. And that would have been perfectly fine and legitimate, right? Um, but because I had an interest in, I want to learn more what it means to negotiate with the opposing party. I want to see if I can find any common ground. Do I have permission from my, my boss to do so? Uh, and the answer was yes. And we did. It was really satisfying to be like, wow, like here's a small change um, for the betterment of California education that might not have happened in this particular way had I not been there, right? So not to like, you know, toot your own horn or anything, but just when you think about the impact that you can have when you sort of um, really, I suppose, commit to um, finding common ground, like being really engaged with all stakeholders, that for me was really, really rewarding. Um, so I think I I covered all of the bases, Adriana. Let me know. <laughs> I forgot some. Yes. No, that was really insightful. And those details are really helpful, I think, to to conceptualize how you did this process. And um, I like that you and Daniel both brought up kind of this idea of a catalyst and being um thinking thinking through or sort of being the middle middle per, middle person between different audiences and all of that. I think it's uh, nice to see that common commonality there. Uh, okay, so real quick, uh, I'm going to go to Aaron and ask you the same question, kind of how's your transition been? Uh, what was that, something exciting you did in the fellowship? And then hopefully we'll have a few minutes for the breakouts. Sure, yeah. Um, so my transition was a little crazy. I had hoped to have some time to sort of stop doing science and then prepare to enter the policy world and then enter the policy world. And that is absolutely not what happened. Um, 
I like rushed to finish my PhD. I was like working all through the night to finish my thesis. And then that was done. And I was still doing experiments the next two days. And then suddenly I had to start the fellowship on Monday. Absolutely crazy. Um, and I'm still trying to wrap up some publications. Like I still go into the lab on weekends sometimes. So that in terms of having like a clean break, absolutely not. Um, so that made it a bit weird because my head was still in two places. But the Eagleson Fellowship is set up really nicely because they intentionally start you during the summer recess. So I came in like end of July and everyone was chilling. Like half the people were on vacation. They had just passed the budget. Like they school's out for summer. They were very chill, very accessible. Everyone wanted to take me out to lunch or like hear about my thesis and get to know me as a person. And there were no deadlines. And it was very sort of choose your own adventure. My boss, she was on vacation. That might not be the best way to start not having any kind of guidance from your supervisor. Um, but it actually worked out really well for me in my PhD. My mentor was also very busy. So I didn't get a lot of handholding in my PhD. And so I wasn't expecting it in the fellowship. And so I got to spend the time getting the lay of the land, asking people dumb questions, um, reading, listening to podcasts, just listening to conversations other people were having. So I could kind of pick up on the terminology and the culture of the office and what it's like to live and breathe in a completely political environment all the time where like somebody's from this county, somebody's from that county, and you have to be really careful the way you talk about certain people, certain places, certain topics. The caucus is all Democrats, but we all know that there's heterogeneity within that. So you can't just come in guns blazing on a particular topic, you might alienate somebody. So it took me a little while to kind of learn that, but starting in July was the perfect time, especially because um, it was an election year. Jersey is like off by one year from everybody else. And so our legislators didn't come back until November. They were all out getting reelected. Um, so it gave me a lot of time to ease that transition, which absolutely was critical. Um, I would say one of the highlights probably would be um, a piece of, well, actually two to four, depending on how you count it, pieces of deep fake legislation that we did this year. Um, I knew that it was a topic I was interested in. And so I did a little digging and I found that there were some bills from last session. So I kind of resurrected them, started conversations in the office about them, made sure that people were paying attention to this issue. And I was kind of raising the alarm. It's an election year. Deep fakes are going to be a big problem. We need to make sure we get this legislation passed before we recess for the summer. Um, and I ended up convincing the chair of my committee that we should do a hearing specifically on deep fakes. And I managed to get all the powers that be to agree with me to let me do it. And I was so excited because I got to find the experts to Daniel's point, like I'm not an AI expert, but I found people at Rutgers. I found people at Princeton. I found people at Columbia and I brought them into this hearing, either in person or virtually. I had them give expert testimony on the issue in general, as well as specific recommendations for the bills that we already had in front of us. And we were able to make substantial improvements to them. Um, so one person in particular that we spoke with, uh, she focuses on sexual deepfakes. So this is a whole rabbit hole issue that we could go into in more detail, but um, deep fakes of a sexual nature are fundamentally different from deep fakes of any other nature. And so the legislation that governs them has to be written very carefully. And the way that it had been done coming into the situation would not have been sufficient. And I felt really good that I was able to bring in these people and make these changes. And I believe those bills are on the governor's desk right now. I haven't checked to see if there's, you know, like a press release that he signed them yet, but the expectation is that he probably will. Um, so I feel really proud of being able to identify an issue, convince people that it needed to be dealt with, 
and then find the experts and bring them in. Many of these people had never been involved in the legislative process before. They didn't know what a hearing was. They thought they were in trouble when I said, do you want to testify? They were like, oh my gosh, I'm not guilty. And I was like, no, 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 that is not what it is. Please don't worry. And I coached them and guided them. And I feel really proud that I was able to bring the experts to the point where the decisions were being made. Um, there are some parts that are frustrating, usually around politics. Um, like to Chanel's point, anything could happen that would kill a bill. There's a million things you could do that would kill a bill. And sometimes I see a legislator doing something that I don't know if they don't understand the repercussions that if you insist on making this amendment that has not been approved by the speaker, the bill will die. And then they like go and do it anyway. It, okay, well, I guess we're not gonna pass that bill this year. So it is kind of frustrating sometimes, but at the same time, I do like not being the person who has to like press the green button or the red button at the end of the day. Um, I do like having that little bit of distance. So I don't really want their job. But sometimes I do wish that I was the person who had been elected. Um, but, you know, it's a trade off. And I think that overall, it's a really good trade. That's really interesting. Well, I liked your point about um, there's no prep time. I, I definitely felt that way. I think any job I've ever had and you kind of get thrown into it like, oh, you're here. Let's do this. And, you know, that's how it goes. Um, I think but I think one thing I guess we'll take away from your remarks to that being proactive and I think saying like I think this is important you know raising your voice and saying I, this is what we should do and that sort of thing so you can still be elected <laughs> yeah. all right we're well, real quick um let's do a bit of breakouts and then uh some of these folks will be back next week for more in-depth discussions but wanted to give you a bit of chance to uh talk one-on-one -on -one too and are we ready for the breakout rooms? Yeah. Do they open? No. It doesn't look like. Hold on, I can just do it from here if you want. No. Hold on, let me try to do it. Oh, wait. Yeah, something weird is going on with this Zoom. Um... The speaker is already in the room. I just need to put the students in there. I think oh. the um, all the breakout we'll rooms are closed. We'll have to open it again. Can you open them again? Okay. Yeah, that's really weird. It says we'll close in 50 seconds. I don't know what's going on. Yeah, I think that's a good idea.
Okay, yeah, let's just not worry about it. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure why the rooms are not working. Um, does anybody have more questions you want to ask? We still have a few minutes. Okay, that's a good idea. Recommendations. Uh, okay, do panelists have recommendations looking back on your time as graduate students? Maybe Erin, do you want to start that one since you're pretty sure. close? Um, so I didn't mention, but I also was involved in a science policy group at the University of Pennsylvania, um, very similar to the one at Johns Hopkins. Um, we worked closely with them. I also I actually also know Chanel um, from before today because we were both in leadership at the National Science Policy Network. Um, so if there is a local group at your university, highly recommend getting involved. Um, if not, definitely get involved with NSPN um, because they provide a lot of training resources. There are workshops, there are seminars, there's a lot of networking opportunities. Um, I would say it's not a requirement. Most of the people in my cohort this year were not involved in policy prior to their fellowship. I thought that was crazy. I was like, how did you even know you wanted to do this? But for me, I couldn't wait. I refused to wait until I graduated to start doing this work. And I'm really glad that I didn't wait because the only experience I have in energy policy is like hooking up with some uh, engineering graduate students and writing policy memos about energy topics that they were interested in. And so I have several publications, like my first publications are not science publications, they're all policy related. So I think that that kind of demonstrated interest and having published work that you can point to in your application makes it a lot easier for somebody to be willing to take a chance on providing all of the training resources. I'll piggyback on what Aaron said about um, networking is such an intimidating word, right? But I like to reframe it as like, engage people who are doing what you want to do. Like make friends with people in the field that you want to be in. <clears throat> like, um, you know, uh, make known to the broader community what you're trying to do and ask for help. Like folks are so um, welcoming and encouraging of, you know, young scholars that are sort of trying to break into science policy. And so being like just a loud and enthusiastic um, advocate for yourself and just sort of continuing to bang that tambourine and just engaging in conversations. And so um, I, like Dan, um, had really painful, grueling experiences, like sitting at home, like just bashing through applications and getting back, you know, very low, you know, rates of return. Um, my uh, traction improved significantly when I started stomping pavement. And by that, I meant informational interviews, going to conferences and going to conferences for the secondary purpose of listening to talks, but I'd have a list of people that were giving talks or that were in attendance. And I wanted to get their business card, ask them a question, like learn more about their program, say, hey, I'm a graduate student, you know, in neuroscience, and I'm interested in policy, you know, like, can I follow up with you? And would you be willing to refer me to position X at institution Y? Because I see that you're on the board of directors, right? And so um, there's advocating for yourself by doing good work and being engaged in local opportunities, but there's also so much power in gathering sort of like a council of advocates on your behalf. And that includes us, like folks here on the call, certainly lean on us, um, but uh, sort of you can elevate your visibility for opportunities so much more when people know who you are. Um, Twitter, well, Twitter is not the place where it used to be, but hashtag SciPol used to be a really uh, great hashtag for following along conversations. Um, there, were, there were people in the community that were sort of, to me, like, you know, low-key Twitter famous because of their prolific you know, writing on an issue. And so then I would follow them and comment on their tweets or comment on their LinkedIn. And then you would see them at a conference or see them online at a, at a virtual, at a, on a webinar. You can DM them and say, hey, and then suddenly now you have a relationship. Hey, I'm looking for jobs. 
Um, people will often know about listings before they're publicly posted. You have a much more powerful opportunity to get to the top of the hiring manager's pile when so-and-so who works there or is known there says, hey, I know Chanel, I think this would be a good opportunity for them. I've asked them to submit their resume, please take a look. And then you know, you just get so many more opportunities for interviews that way. I've had interviews where I, <clears throat> excuse me, didn't get the job, but it was a great, like, I think this was um, true for ASBNB, Daniel, or um, Society for Neuroscience, where I didn't get the job, but I had a great conversation. This was work I was still committed to doing. And I, you know, you kind of sense the hiring manager if they're going to be hit to the question. But I would say, hey, um, you know, thank you for the opportunity to interview. I'm still interested in opportunities like this. Um, would you, uh, it, do you have any feedback for me, you know, on how I could sort of, um, you know, be competitive in this role? Um, or I see that there's a listing at sister organization, you know, whatever. If you know the hiring manager there, and if you think that I'm a strong candidate, let, let's say I made it to final round, right? Since I made it to final round, and maybe I'm a strong candidate, you know, would you be comfortable recommending me to that hiring manager? No one gets mad at you for asking, you know, especially when you ask with that sort of, you know, humility and graciousness. And what comes off is just that enthusiasm. Um, the, it, the world is now very online. And so if you do have a social media presence, it can be powerful to kind of um, develop a voice or develop an online brand. And so let's say, you know, like for me, I don't have a background in AI or in neurotechnology, although I did do basic neuroscience, but I'm very interested now in neurotechnology and AI and ethics. You don't need to have anyone's permission to start talking about it or writing about it now using the platforms you have available on social media. Um, there are also lots of places where you can publish. Um, National Science Policy Network, you know, has um, lots of opportunities to do blogs or to do um, like write science policy memos. The Journal of Science Policy and Governance, um, which has a CCST fellow uh, in leadership, which is really great, former CCST fellow, um, offers opportunities for, um, you know, young uh, sort of scholars in training, you know, to write and develop a, uh, d develop a, a writing record. And so I guess my advice to my former self would be, <clears throat> um, yes, there's sort of the, you know, cold application and applying, but I think that the I got the most juice out of the squeeze when I was really investing in like key relationships and those relationships pay dividends forever. As you can see, you know, Dan and I um, went to school together, Adriana and I um, like we met very early in our sort of um, like science policy career and we're meeting up at conferences and advising each other. I still go to Adriana, you know, for advice. And so, you know, have your crew, you know, have your ride or dies, you know, folks that are like happy to refer you, um, happy to tell you the, the real skinny on this job experience, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, happy to talk to you about places where I think you'd thrive or about places where I think, mm, based on everything I know about you, Chanel, and your quirks and your interests, this placement might not be, you know, the best fit, and here's why. Saves you a little bit of time. So you're part of this amazing cohort on the call right now, you know, your classmates and colleagues and all of these mentors. Lean on each other because 10 years from now, a lot of us are still going to be around, but, you know, director of X, you know, or senior policy advisor, you know, for Y. So the work starts now, um, but it continues for as long as you are, as you want to be engaged. Your, your, your best resource, I think, are other people. So don't think of it as networking. Think of it as like, who's my tribe and how can me and my tribe support one another? That's really good advice. Thank you. And Daniel, so I guess same for you. Uh, I know we're out of time. Um, I'll just say one thing. Um, yeah. I'm not religious, but um, I like to go by the mantra of Jesus take the wheel sometimes. Uh, you know, the, your next step is not going to be your last step. And here I am, you know, three careers later, um, doing something new and different. And I love it. And I've never thought about it when I was a grad student. And, you know, let the doors open, cultivate your relationships and go with your gut and, you know, explore and have fun and, you know, like what you like and make a difference. That's great. Right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, despite all the technical issues we've had, which we've never had in this class, so uh, up to now, I think this was a fantastic panel, really great advice um, and wanted to just share again the LinkedIn group. Um, we encourage you to join next week uh, for folks who are able to 
come and speak, uh, but do connect to these folks on LinkedIn. Uh, the group is meant for uh, creating a community within this class as well and, and connecting with speakers we've had over the years and with each other uh, to Chanel's point. So we're growing a network here within our uh, our program. So thank you again for being here and uh, we'll see you next time.